quick announcement. If anybody has multiple devices playing, please make sure you mute one of them so we avoid back feed or feedback dyslexia, sorry. So guys, we have a great treat for you guys tonight. We have uh, Jeremy Horn. Uh, some of you may have heard of him. He, he's fought a lot. He's fought uh, everybody. Um, Anderson Silva, Chuck Liddell, uh, Chael Sonnen a number of times. Uh, he's been around the block. And uh, what I love about his style is it's mostly grappling based. He is a jiu-jitsu black belt, but he didn't get into gi until after his retirement. Um, he is my teacher, my mixed martial arts teacher, uh, my manager, and a good friend of mine, and we're so happy to have him on tonight. Uh, we will take the advantage of this opportunity and give any questions that you have in the chat, and I'll facilitate and get that out to him. And uh, Professor Buyu, Professor Tom will give us a QA and a um, at the end, too. And if you guys have any questions for any of the professors, we have a whole bunch of black belts on tonight. And uh, any questions for them, jujitsu related or right li life related, throw it in the chat. And uh, this is really, technique is important for us, but socialization and having our ghost squad family together uh, during this time where we're isolated is huge. And that's our main priority right now. So uh, Professor Bui, I'll turn it over to you real quick. If you have anything. No, just uh, once again, I wanna say thank you for everybody that's, uh, uh, with us in this journey, you know, um, I was talking to two good friends of mine this afternoon, and it's not about me, it's not about one individual, it's about everybody, you know. Uh, it's a moment in time that some people look forward to this time. Uh, we try to make sure to accommodate to everybody. Feel free to ask any questions, you know, from a white belt to a black belt, everybody's free to add something, you know. Uh, let's use this platform for our own well-being. It's just one hour. Let's make it as pleasant as possible. We are on this chat like Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, twice a week, you know. But uh, I just want to say thank you for everyone that's, that's taking their time to, to be here. Really thank you. Awesome. Bro, you got anything, Tom? No, guys, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm super excited about this. Um, I, Jeremy's a good friend of Amir's, um, but I cherish every time we get a chance to, to learn from him. I still, I, I was telling him the other day, I actually still use stuff that I, I learned from Jeremy at a seminar 10 years ago uh, over at Amir's place. So, and now I, I see it everywhere. I set it up from everywhere. So lots of great stuff. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Awesome, awesome. Jeremy, thank you so much for being here tonight. What do you have in store for us? Uh, well, I, uh, I was going to go over some half guard stuff, but uh, you know, a lot of it is kind of, I, I think it's probably pretty typical. Most of you guys probably already know, but uh, you know, everybody's got a slightly different perspective and a different take on it. So I figured I'd go over that. That's one of the biggest things that I work on. So I figured we'd go over that. Awesome. That would be great. We're looking forward to it. And Guy, thanks for helping Horn. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you for being there. Yeah, kind of hard to do any any half guard stuff without a without a partner. <laughs> He's good enough. He doesn't need me. <laughs> All right. Well, we're ready whenever you are, Jeremy. Okay. Uh, let me. Uh, I want to make sure I can get a decent angle here on the on the shot here. So how do I how do I change this so that I just see my own camera? So just double click on your screen. Uh, double click on me. Uh, again. Oh, because I've got it on speaker view. Nope. Yeah, now double click. Now there we go. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So one of the things that, that I try to do a lot is uh, I don't like being in the guard at all. <clears throat> I use it as much as I have to, but I try to keep it to a bare minimum. I think that it's way more important to fight to get on top and either back to your feet or at least on top. So most of what I do, uh, I, I realized, I found this out when I started uh, – when I started messing around with the gi is my guard is actually not very good. Um, the hard part is it's hard for people to pass my guard without giving me an opportunity to get up because I've got a pretty good half guard and, and I'm hard to hold down. Uh, but if I just lay on my back and, and try to use my guard, it's actually not very good. 
uh, when you add the element of me being able to get up, up is when it gets a little bit more uh, hard to deal with. So I do a lot of half guard stuff um, and I work to get back to my feet a lot or at least on top. So one of the things that I do uh, a lot, I'm, I'm hoping you guys can still hear me when I start moving away from the, uh, the camera a little bit here. But so one thing that I think is real important is if I've got a guy here in a half guard and I'm working through you know, my, my legs, I'm trying to get all of his legs back and forth. You guys can see me here. Okay, so I'm gonna start with that basic figure four. That's always what I'm looking to do to try to, to start gaining some control from movement here. But generally, I can't, go ahead, I can't keep this for long. This guy's gonna start working their way out. But as soon as he does, uh, one of the biggest ones is this knee will come up. He'll post his knee to prevent me from getting a grip on it. So I work through that here a lot by putting my heel, my foot on the back of his heel and using that to get my leg inside. And it gives me a good grip on it here to transfer it to my other hand. So as soon as we land here, I'm generally looking to wrap that up, but if guys are sharp and they start defending that point, guys can get in here right away and get to that grip. Uh, so I use that one a lot, just to, the, to transition from that basic figure four to that butterfly guard, because that really is where I'm trying to go. I don't like my legs on the outside. Uh, it gives people an opportunity to get to, you know, attack my legs and stuff. So I always try to get my feet on the inside. Um, and then from there, going into a butterfly guard. What I call an ankle ankle pick sweep. Um, I think it's called a waiter sweep to other people. Um, you guys are all familiar with the basic series of, of sweeps and stuff from there, I'm assuming. Yeah. That we are, but I think that's exactly what I wanted you to show tonight because you have you hit that at will on everybody that you roll with. So if you could just go over that one more time with the hand placement and the lockdown variation that you do. Sure. Is this, can you guys see, is this a decent angle and you can still hear me and everything? It is. It's very good. Yep. You're doing a great okay. job. Um, so obviously in jujitsu, the, the more, the more you use your feet, obviously the, the better dexterity they develop, but that's one thing that, that helps a ton is I use my feet to manipulate his leg. And a lot of it tends to be just kind of playing on what I know he's going to try to do. So when I'm trying to manipulate his leg, you know, I'm looking to get this locked, uh, try to get this figure four locked up here. I try to get this figure four locked up. If I can get to this, then I've got a lot of options from here. I can, I can start attacking that. But the idea of this is that I'm driving his knee to the ground somewhat, and I drive his ankle up and out. And that's what gives me uh, good pressure against his leg. So what he generally is going to try to do to prevent that is put that foot down and put the knee up something along those lines. It can be further away or, or uh, uh, a couple of different options. But the most common is this. So when I'm trying to get this locked up, as soon as he feels I'm trying to do that, he posts that up. So I block his heel with my foot and I can actually move his foot a little bit if I need to. And then I can get his foot inside real easy. So it's easy to get a transition from this when he tries to defend, get in there and transfer it to my hand. Along with that, I, I, I should be doing this all along, is I want to get my left hand inside his leg here, and I want his, his leg up by my head. If I get his leg up by my head, so my left arm is through here nice and deep, his hips are running parallel to my spine. When I get this, I take this ankle, pull it up into my armpit, flare this knee out to the side a little bit, and he's going to go, not quite 6 o'clock, but just to his front side here. Okay, and it makes it real easy for me to roll right up into a good position here to work through for that pass. That's, is that what you're looking for, Amir? Is that what you're talking about? That's awesome. One small detail that a lot of people miss that aren't on the horn level is the downward pressure on the knee and the upward pressure on the foot. Could you go over that detail one more time? Yeah, so what can happen a lot uh, is when I grab his foot and it's down here by my butt, a lot of people just hang onto the foot and they try to push with the leg. And what ends up happening is most of the time that can work. But if my partner has longer legs than me, as I extend, my leg will eventually slip and he'll slide over my leg to the mount. By pulling his foot up into my armpit, it allows me to flex more from my hip here instead of with my leg here. 
So pulling his foot into my armpit keeps his leg closer to me and I can get that same leverage without needing to extend my leg. So if I've got somebody with way longer legs than me, I can still pull this off pretty easily. So, yeah, so instead of, instead of holding his foot and pushing and he ends up just standing up, you know, and I slip away, I pull his foot into my armpit and then I can flare with my knee. And I don't have to extend my leg at all. I don't have to extend my leg. I can keep my, my knee bent and extend my hip. And that's what takes him over much easier. And I still defend that space fairly cleanly. Beautiful. Now, uh, if you guys could just move up to that first tape line and a little bit north, uh, we have a question about, is this dangerous or does this create an opportunity for your opponent to try to mount you? And how do you negate that? So that's something that is, is very important. And that's something that I, I stress through all of grappling is the concept of protecting the line between your leg and your arm. This line here, or rather this, it's kind of a three-dimensional space from your hip to your knee, to your elbow, to your armpit. Okay, so right now it's a square. Now it's basically a triangle, okay? So the bigger this space gets, the greater chance there is for him to slip something in there and get to the mount. By controlling his foot and keeping that tight pressure across my leg, it doesn't allow him to mount me. If I stretch out, it opens that space up bigger and then he might be able to. So by pulling his foot in, it's kind of like, uh, you guys have done, um, let me think, I don't know the name of it, but there's a sweep where you have your, arm, your leg inside of his arm and I grab his wrist and wrap it around my leg and I sweep him from there, right? It's the same idea. If I'm holding his arm tight enough here, if I've got his arm tight enough, he can't slip his arm over my leg. Same thing with his leg. If I'm holding his ankle tight enough, he can't do it because I'm flaring this way. If I do this, he might. That's what you're talking about getting mounted, right? It is, and, and that creating that monkey trap is essential. That's what I was uh, referring to also with, about the lockdown, your initial figure four lockdown. Yes. Pressure downward on that knee and up on the foot. If you could go over that one more time. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And also, so, uh, one, one other major game changer I learned from you, um, and I think you were teaching it on The Ultimate Fighter with Corey Hill, the concept of keeping your elbows to your knees and not allowing anything in there, what you were just talking about. Yes. So if you guys can switch a little north one more time to that first sure. tape line and go over those two things. Yeah, so that's, that's one thing that I think is really, really important, and a lot of people miss out on that. Most people grew up with a trampoline, at least the people my age did. And uh, it was a game called Crack the Egg that was pretty popular, where one person would sit like this, and the other people would bounce on the trampoline, the first person to break, you know, then you lose. Uh, caused a lot of people to land on their head and hurt their necks and stuff, but the concept is the same. If I can defend this space, and he can't put anything in there, he doesn't have an underhook, he can't get to the mount, he can't get to side control. If I can keep his body out of this space on both sides, then I can protect myself. So it happens all the time in grappling. Everybody does it, but I don't know how many people actually look at it from this perspective. You know, when you, when you break the mount and you're shrimping your hips away, that's what you're doing. You're pushing his leg out of that space. Hmm. Uh, so people do it all the time, but I don't know how, how in depth they think about it. So as far as that leg goes, what I'm looking for is as soon as we land here, I'm trying to get to this figure four because this gives me an opportunity just to hang on and, and calm down and stall it out of there. So go ahead and stay right there. So here's the thing. If he's in side control uh, or, or in a half guard, this is where his posture is cleanest, okay? His, his knees spread out wide, sometimes sitting on his feet, but this is what, what creates a good base, okay? This is what gives him a good balance. If his knee is on the ground and I can take his ankle and manipulate it out this way, it ruins his base. That's what gives me the opportunity to attack and move. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do when I have that figure four. It's very subtle, but it's the same thing. When I start cranking on this, it's kind of putting his ankle this way, which makes his base compromised. If he can tuck his foot under his butt here, this is a good solid base. It's gonna be hard for me to move him, but if I get this foot in here and I start attacking that ankle, 
now I've got control of this side of his, his body, this corner of his face, and I can start attacking from there. And we can get into all that same stuff from here because I've got a good grip on it. I've got pressure out here. He's not gonna be able to do much. And if you guys are familiar with the basic figure four, if I've got a good grip on this, he's not gonna slide his knee through the middle either. If I don't have that, then yeah, that knee can come through the middle and I might get mounted. But if I've got a good grip on that ankle, that's not gonna happen. So to, to avoid a lot of the baseball slide passes from that position, this point is very important, that knee pressure downwards and upward on the foot. Yeah, and it's, I mean, if you guys have all done that figure four, um, I, I, do, I use that figure four a lot. Uh, a lot of people call it a lockdown. I use that a lot to make him try to fight through there, and then I can get my foot inside because most of the time they can't pull their knee up. If they get their knee up past my waist, if their knee goes north of my waist, I'm in trouble and I got to change gears and I got to start defending a little differently. Um, and if I've got my arms inside, then I just let him pass to the side and then I get up. Or if he's going to the mount, then I go out the other side. But a lot of it comes down to defending that. Uh, but again, that's kind of another story. If he gets his knee north of my belt. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, I don't want to interrupt you. If you wanted to go into that waiter sweep, that's fine. But we do have one question at this point. Absolutely. Uh, I prefer questions. That's concerning the opponent's hands. What do we do to keep his hands occupied at that time while you're doing this technique to prevent him from punching you uh, in an MMA fight or a self-defense situation? So that's something that is, uh, it's a common concept. And what I've always tried to do is, like there are really only two positions in a, in a fight um, in, the, in the, the broader sense of things. You're either on offense or you're on defense, okay? And even if you can switch roles from offense to defense on a split second back and forth, you are still always on one or the other. You can never do both. Uh, so if I'm on the bottom and I'm constantly attacking his position and I'm constantly working through and, and, and being aggressive, he has to be on defense. If my tech, technique is clean and, I'm, and I'm, I'm staying consistent. So if he were to switch for a second and try to hit me and go on offense, his defense is suffering and I'm going to sweep it. Mm. So the biggest thing that I do to prevent getting hit is move fast and be aggressive and go after this, you know, aggressively. That's, that's my biggest thing. Constantly displacing his balance and base. Yep. Okay. Very good. Constantly attacking his balance, give, give his hands other things to think about. Awesome. Before we move on to that sweep, do you mind if we take one more question? Absolutely. Okay. This is from uh, uh, professor Tom. He says, can you show other setups that you used to get there? This is, he, he remembers a few that you did from the seminar about 10 years ago. <laughs> um, uh, that He says he still uses them and he loves them and he would really love for you to share them. I don't remember which ones he's referring to, but if you have a few that you go to, if you would share those here. Well, so a lot of times I, I am I'm huge at the butterfly guard. Um, I'm a huge fan of the butterfly guard. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times my setups will come from there. I am always striving to get my feet inside. Um, I don't like having my legs wrapped around a guy uh, because that's, that's an easy way for him to attack my ankles uh, because if you're going to do anything, you got to open your legs. So any attack that I do from the guard is going to expose my legs to get an ankle lock uh, for a good leg lock guy, obviously. Um, so my goal has always been from the very beginning to try to get my feet to the inside to a butterfly guard. Um, and then we go into that half guard there very easily. So that usually is my first order of business is if my feet are not inside is to get them inside uh, one way or another. Uh, so, I mean, there's a couple of different options from just like a basic half guard. I can put my feet in, but that's what it really boils down to. I'm not sure exactly uh, which one he was thinking of, um, but, uh, but that's, what, that's generally my, my first order of business, get your feet inside. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we can go ahead and go into that next sweep, and then we, uh, I'll save these other couple questions for you here at the end. Into, into that, uh, that, that waiter sweep, the ankle pick? Yeah, yes, the, the general go-to for you is uh, where you switch that foot around, get a hook, and grab the ankle. Mm -hmm. So what I'm, what I'm trying to do, and this is one that a lot of people have trouble with, with the, the, the idea, the line that we're sweeping him here. When I get him lined up, and I'll do this, uh, I'll talk through it again. I, I feel like when I'm so far away, you guys can't hear me. Uh, but uh, so when I get him lined up, I'm trying to take him not exactly south of me, like six o'clock, but just a, a few degrees inside of that to where he would be able to put his hands on the ground. A lot of people try to drive the guy to his backside and that causes his legs to bind up. It seems more natural that way that I'm gonna to try to sweep him directly to his back, but it actually is, it does not work that well. Um, if I take him slightly to his front first, then I can roll him to his back 
much easier. So uh, let me see if I can find a decent angle here to, to show you what I mean by that. Yeah. You guys still hear me okay from here? Yes, you're good. Oh, wow, that's awesome. I can't believe the, the audio is still like this. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'm, I wanna sweep you straight towards the camera. So if we're here and I get this angle set up, okay? What most people would try to do is sweep him directly to his back, to my left side over here. And what ends up happening is his right leg on my left shoulder is going to get bound up. I don't know if you guys see or visualize where his right leg is, but if I take him directly this way, his leg gets bound up and it's an awkward position for him. So anything I try to do, sweeping him anywhere in this angle is awkward and clumsy. And when we're training, I'm going to end up hurting my butt. If I take him over here just a little bit to where he's kind of going to his front side, then we'll take him over here. It's much, much easier. So when I sweep him, I go here first. So he's slightly to his front side. And then when we finish, I'll end up rolling him to his back side a bit here. But if I try to take him directly to this side first, this leg gets really bound up. And uh, my general idea is, the smoother a technique is, it means two things. It means number one, in training, I'm not gonna hurt my friends because I'm not rolling him over his ankle or his knee or talking something funny. But that also means that in a competition, it's gonna be more successful. The smoother and cleaner something is, the less you hurt your friends and the more successful you are in competition. So it just pays to always try to be as smooth as possible and never force anything. You guys all know that, that's pretty common. But this is one where I see a lot of people struggle with this because it's natural to try to drive him directly to his back or, or mostly directly to his back instead of letting him go to his front side of just a few degrees first and then rolling him to his back. Awesome. It does. Awesome. Now uh, we have a couple of requests to see it live or just regular stream. Sure. Can you do me a favor, Horn, and uh, do a uh, 90 degree pivot to your left? So you're- Come on, me going this way? Perfect. Yep, excellent, thank you. Back here, so you can see that sweep a little better. So it'd be here. I go here, I'm looking to lock this up. He defends it. When he defends, I come in here. here. Awesome. I still hold on to that ankle. I keep his foot stapled to the ground. My legs, his legs stapled to the ground. My foot ended up in a real clean pass here. I can go here through the front, or depending on how much he defends, I can let go and come around the back as well. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, buddy. Speaking of not hurting your training partners and your friends, somebody's asking if you have any leg locks from that position or if you like them. Um, from the uh, from the bottom there? Really anywhere in that vicinity, what your thoughts are on leg locks and uh, if you could show one or two if you Yeah, so I, I do a couple leg locks. I'm not a big fan of leg locks because kind of the same idea we were talking about. You know, leg locks are they're certainly a good tool and they become really, really popular in the, uh, in the competition Jiu Jitsu scene. Um, and they have their place and certainly you should know them defensively, but just along the same lines of not hurting your partner, I think leg locks kind of follow that same example, but the opposite. In training, they can be kind of dangerous, uh, especially if people aren't familiar with them, guys get hurt, they don't. I had a guy uh, actually just uh, a month ago, the guy got his ankle broken because somebody was doing an ankle lock to him and he didn't, he didn't know what it was. And it didn't even really hurt. And then his ankle popped and he thought, oh, I think that's bad. He got up and walked out um, and was fine. And then called me two weeks later and said, yeah, my ankle's broken. Wow. So, you know, ankle locks are, are, are dangerous in training because you're gonna hurt your friends. And obviously you can see, I mean, it broke his ankle and he didn't even, it didn't even hurt that much. So how valuable is that in a fight? If you can actually break somebody's ankle and it still doesn't even stop them, mm. you know? so. And that's, you know, that's just one example. Uh, but, but that's just kind of my, my mentality as far as leg lock goes is I don't like them. Uh, they, they, tend to, they tend to be dangerous in training unless you're really, really familiar with them and good. And they're not as reliable in a fight as, as people think they are. Um, the grappling scenario obviously is, uh, is a different scene. It's not quite the same. Uh, but still, I've seen people get their ankles uh, broken in matches too and not quit. So... Oh, yeah, that being said, there is one that I like to do a lot from here that's, that's pretty tricky, but I end up using it more as a sweep than anything else. So I'll show you that one here real quick. So again, it comes in that same position, that same half guard, butterfly guard type position here, where I'm starting here. 
Okay, so I'm here. I got my right foot inside, however it came from there. My left arm is through, I'm attacking this leg, and here's what we're looking for. All I'm gonna try to do is I'm going to lift his leg up with my right foot. And I'm gonna rely on the fact that it's his instinct to try to keep that foot on the ground. So his leg will stay relatively pointed at the ground. When that happens, I swing my left leg back, and I catch his ankle on the front of my left leg, and then I bring it back in front of my leg. Leg over here. Now I've got his uh, foot on my hip, and I've got my legs trying. So from here, I just extend my hips, and it's kind of the same idea for that sweep, but now his leg is trapped, and he's either going to tap because it hurts, or he's going to roll over, which gives me that same opportunity to come up and finish that sweep that way. Yeah, I love that one uh, ever since you hit so it. That's, it's time that's one that I do a lot, but mostly I do it because uh, I'm trying to get the guy, you know, if I can't catch his foot with my hand, I'll try to catch it with my legs because I still want that sweep. Perfect. Love that one. Uh, we do have a question from Nacho. He says, when you go against a heavier opponent, getting to that sweep, you should, are you, are you showed, are you going maximum effort to pull off the opponent towards your head? Uh, it seems that um, the lack of leverage points to manipulate the heavier opponent for him. Um, so uh, there's a couple things that'll happen here. If you have that person's weight sitting directly on your chest and you can take that ankle away and pull that ankle into your armpit, a lot of his weight will fall the direction you want him to. Uh, but weight is a factor. You know, it depends on how good he is. If we're talking about a guy that, that weighs 400 pounds but he knows nothing about jujitsu, then yeah, I'm going to sweep him easily. Uh, but if he's a guy that's, you know, outweighs me by 40 pounds, um, but he's good, it, it's going to matter. Weight, weight is always a factor, and somebody that knows how to use it well um, can, can make this hard. But for the most part, if I get underneath him and I have his weight sitting on the center of my, center of my uh, body here, then that sweep is, is manageable. Awesome. Uh, we have a request for you to show that last calf slicer one more time, and if you could just show slowly how you sneak that bottom hip out sure. and get it in place, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, so the thing about that is um, I, I, I can grab it with my hand if I want to, but I try not to because that kind of, it's a bit of a tell, you know, it's a telegraph, he's going to see what I'm after. So what I'm generally relying on is the fact that most people want to be connected to the ground. It's kind of instinct. They, they want to have control of their own body weight. So if, if I have my leg here, if my leg is here and somebody picks my leg up, my instinct is that my foot still kind of points at the ground because I, I want my own leg on the ground. I want to be under my own power. So when I pick his knee up, his leg is going to dangle like that. If I pick his knee up and he does this and he pulls his leg away from me, then maybe it's not going to work. And sometimes guys that are a little, little sharper, they've been doing jujitsu for longer, that, that will exactly be the case. But I catch people with this a lot, even when they're not, you know, when they're not new, um, just because they're, they're not paying attention to it. But that's kind of the point here. So when we're here, his leg wants to be on the ground, okay? He wants to have it under his own power. He wants to be in control of his own body weight. So when I pick his leg up, he's gonna leave it dangling on the ground, okay? So as soon as I pick his leg up, I just swing my left leg back, and then I put his foot down, and then I bring my leg back in. So that's all I'm really doing without him. I'm just moving, going back up. All I'm doing is just moving my bottom leg. I pick his leg up, I move my leg, I put it down, I bring my leg back in. That's my motion. So now, when he's here, I get his foot in here, and I just pick his leg up and swing my leg back. And then I just put some pressure on it, and he'll roll down for me. Even, even if you don't get his foot right in the hip uh, when you start, there's always the possibility of scooting it or scooping it up with your quad like you just did. Yes, and that, that, that's what will generally happen. It'll be up fairly snug most of the time, uh, but when you bring your leg back up in quickly, it will slide up into your hip if it's not there already. Now, do you have a preference on where we anchor the hands? Should it be on the same side hip or the far hip, or does it not matter for you? So it doesn't much matter. Um, what I do try to do is, in that, in that technique we just did, I had my left arm under his leg, I try to stay controlled tightly on that hip because 
if he tries to stand up and he opens his hips up, there's not as much pressure on his other leg. So, I mean, if the guy's really going crazy, I'll take both hands and I'll hug that near hip just to keep him close to me. But most of the time, I'll leave that other hand just kind of floating loose to, to do whatever it needs to do. But yeah, I do want to keep him relatively close. The more he stands up, the more he can get away from me and uh, alleviate some of that pressure. Awesome, awesome. Let me see if anybody has any more questions about jujitsu, MMA, or fighting before we open it up to general questions. Guys, if anybody has any questions, please put it in the chat and I'll relay it to Horn. Amaya, come here. Uh, so real quick, I, I use this now in, uh, since you showed that exact move uh, at Amir's place like 10 years ago, I use it from everywhere. So I just wanted to like quickly refresh what I was talking about in some of the positions. Um, I don't know if you showed it from, from these, all of these, but the idea is from butterfly guard, since you said you like butterfly guard so much, this was the one that I think you showed it from, where just like a regular butterfly sit up, she catches, right? And then you kind of do the same, same thing from here. Yes. Right? And then another one that I use it quite a bit is when they have, like, I'm kind of on my side and they have like the back, right? I don't know if how well you can see me, but she has my back here and she tries to step over to like get maybe a bow and arrow choke or some other sort of thing. So I capture it here, lift, and I have the same position for that. Yep. Or just, just from a regular mount, she has me mounted, right? And I'll bump to a shrimp out, get that knee in, and now I set it up just from a regular sh shrimp escape from mount. Yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm such a huge fan of like the butterfly guard and the half guard. Because to me, um, the guys at the gym kind of give me a hard time because like to me, they're all one position. Half guard, butterfly guard, I mean, like a butterfly guard um, and then you stick your leg through, now it's a half guard. You know, you pull that leg back through, you can switch sides there. You know, they're, they're so interchangeable. It's, I, I, I look at it like this, like, is the number three different than the number 3.1? Yes, but depending on your purpose, not really. It's close enough, right? That's kind of how I look at all these different positions. The half guard, the butterfly guard, um, you know, the half butterfly guard, they're all so interchangeable. They all work back and forth together. You can go from one to the other and flow so smoothly between them. I just look at them as all one position. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Now, Horn, you came up in a room full of all Americans. You had Hughes, Lawler, French, uh, Vici, all those guys. Uh, so your takedowns had to be pretty technical. <laughs> we have a question here. Uh, what's, if any, favorite takedowns for BJJ? Maybe things that worked well for you in MMA that you could translate over to a BJJ game. Um, well, so it depends. I mean, the, the part of the reason my guard is good is because my takedowns aren't that good. Most of the guys in back in Iowa would uh, would just smash me, so I got good on the bottom. Um, but one thing that that again that I've always tried to do is I try to gravitate towards looking at. You know, the same kind of thing, the, the, the safe takedowns. I try to move in directions and angles that don't compromise my partner's joints um, for two reasons. Number one, in training, it's safer. And in a fight, it's more likely to, to finish at, you know. So, like, let's say we got, like, a double leg for an example here. Let me get back on my own screen here. If I'm here, come over here, face me, guy. If we're here and I'm trying to shoot a double leg here, here and I'm trying to drive him this way, okay? If his right leg is stuck out there real hard, I can try to chop that leg down and buckle his knee and try to drive over the top of that. And maybe I do it, but maybe I hurt my friend or maybe in a fight, I'm not strong enough to chop that leg down. So instead of that, if he's gonna try to sprawl on me and I can't get that leg in, I just turn and go this way and I'll, I'll just go a different direction. Rather than, rather than fighting against that joint, I've always tried to just try to turn and find the path of least resistance. So that being said, usually that single leg is easiest because I can switch directions a lot on it and it flows really well into all the half guard stuff. Um, I don't know uh, how familiar you guys are with Jeff Monson and, and what he does in his grappling, but he does this very, very well. If he takes a shot and somebody sprawls on him, as long as he gets a hold of one leg, he'll lay on his side and just kind of Homer Simpson walk his legs around until he pulls you into a half guard and then he'll get up and finish the takedown. And it works really, really well for people that are comfortable off their back and not the greatest wrestlers. 
Nice. You guys know what I mean by the Homer Simpson walk, right? Uh, yeah, I do, I do, but I'd love to see you demonstrate that <laughs> all these people. So, uh, so when we're here, all I'm doing is just this. That is Jeremy Horn's best technique. <laughs> it's when uh, in, in one of the Simpsons episodes, Bart wrote something on the back of his head, and Homer was doing that, trying to read what was written on the back of his head. So he walked around in a circle trying to read that. But here, here's where that comes into play. So. I take a shot on guy and he sprawls on me. And we're here, okay? And I'm never gonna finish a shot from here because he sprawled out and he beat me completely. But if I can get to here, I do this. Now it goes right and I can come up and finish that shot. Or if he drives into me, now we're into that half guard and I'm ready to get started with everything that we just did. Beautiful. So if you're comfortable off of your back this is it's an easy finish that generally you'll finish up on top anyway you won't be on your back but in the off chance that you might you roll right into that half guard and you need all that good stuff anyway awesome we have a few questions in the queue here for you uh the first one is do you use the same style of grappling that you did in mma in gi as you did in no gi or is, have you had to modify it um i use mostly the same style in gi um I really don't do a ton with the gi. The collars and the sleeves, you know, obviously the grip slows you down quite a bit. So I'm still kind of adjusting to that. My biggest problem is when I put on a gi, I try to completely focus on using the gi. So I might as well go back to being a white belt because I, you know, I'm, I'm chasing guys lapels and sleeves and they're just floating through my guard. Um, so it, it definitely is going to change your style a bit, but I think for the most part, once you get the hang of the collar and the sleeves and uh, and some of the friction, it did. Same idea. Like I, I watch a ton of Marcelo Garcia videos. That guy's a, a genius, as most of you guys know. So his style doesn't change much from no gi to gi. Beautiful, beautiful. Another question from uh, Professor Tom. You, you're very well known for being one of the fighters that has the most wins in MMA. How did you fight so much and keep from getting hurt? Um, just because it's always been my my style is I want to win as fast as possible, as cleanly as possible. So I'm not, I mean, that's one thing that's always been a little bit of a difference between me and other fighters. I, I fight for me, I fight because I want to win. Um, and I like, I like competing. And I appreciate that the fans enjoy watching me fight. But to be perfectly honest, I don't care if they, want, if they like me the way I fight or not. I'm there, to, I'm there to win as fast as possible and get out of there without taking damage. So. I'm not there to, to put on a show for the fans. I'm not going to take any risks that, uh, that are unnecessary. Um, that and I grew up with two older brothers that beat me constantly. So I think I just grew up kind of tough, but, uh, but that's the biggest thing. You know, I'm not, I've never been a big stand up guy. I'm not going to try to box for somebody to entertain the fans. I'm not trying to win knockout of the night. I'm trying to get out of there as fast as possible without taking any damage. So awesome. if you do that, I think, I think it can be done. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question about your training frequency and modality right now. How often are you training now that you're retired? Or actually, uh, I just thought <laughs> you're not retired. No, not, not, not quite. I never actually officially retired. Uh, just as other things started becoming more important, um, you know, fighting just kind of slipped down the list of, of priorities a little bit. But it looks like I'm going to be fighting again in, uh, in May for money, uh, I think in the Midwest somewhere. But obviously with all this going on right now, the dates are not set in stone yet. But He's looking at, I think, sometime in late May, uh, but we'll see where that goes. But yeah, so, you know, th that fire never, never goes away. You know, if you're, if you're a competitor, you're a competitor till the day you die, um, you know, just whether or not your body can, can keep up with it. So mine can. I'm still pretty healthy. I still am training every day, uh, not now, but generally. I teach every, uh, every day and uh, I'm training most days. Is that six days a week? Uh, Monday through Thursday, and then uh, on Saturday, I usually go shoot a match, so that's still training, uh, <laughs> at, le at least for me. That's something that I think is pretty important as well. Um, but yeah, so I train Monday through Thursday usually, and then I shoot on Saturdays. That's one thing a lot of people don't know about you is that you're a pretty avid shooter, competitive shooter now. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. I've been watching your, uh, your YouTube videos. You're getting pretty good. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I I've always felt like, uh, like... I look at this kind of like uh, like an upgraded version of the Boy Scouts. You know, I mean, MMA to me is, 
you know, for a lot of people, it is a, it, it's a sport and it's a, it's a competitive martial arts endeavor. But for me, it really is more of like a total lifestyle. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's self-defense. It's, you know, like I said, I shoot, I, you know, I, I, I camp, I, I know how to, I know how to build shelters. I know how to navigate outdoors. Um, you know, all of this stuff to me is all kind of part of the same family. You know, if you're, if you're a great fighter, but you can't shoot, you're not, you're not complete. You know, if you're a great shooter, but you can't fight, same thing. If you, if you can do both of those, but you can't change a tire, you're not complete. You know, I mean, if you, we're all trying to be self-reliant here, right? So I think you need to pay attention to all the different facets of, of what it means to, to be self-reliant. Awesome. The last question we have in the queue so far is how did you get into martial arts and how old were you? Uh, I started training in martial arts when I was 12. Um, I did it because my older brother was actually training in a, in a local club. And, uh, you know, like most people just got sucked in through the, through the local karate movies. Uh, it actually just played again on, on uh, Netflix, uh, the movie Bloodsport. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how long it's been on Netflix, but I saw somebody posted it. So uh, that was one of the biggest movies that got me, got me interested in martial arts. And then, like I said, my older brother, uh, man, that movie was corny. I watched it again and I can't believe I used to love that movie so much, right? <laughs> Daniel's asking uh, what your favorite fight was in your career. Uh, my fight with Forrest Griffin, that, that actually that whole tournament. Um, you know, it, for anybody that's ever done any kind of competition, you'll, you'll know what I mean. And that is, you, you never feel like you did your best. Win or lose, there's always something that you could have done better. Um, no, nobody ever fights up to their full potential, I think. At least I, I never did. Um, and in that tournament, I, I came as close as I ever have to, to doing what I, what I feel like I'm truly capable of. And Amir, you, I know you're the same way. You know, you, you look back at fights even where you did amazingly well, and you're like, well, I could have done this a little better. I could have done this a little better. I was a little slow here, you know. But uh, that night, uh, it, was a, it was an eight-man tournament, so I fought three fights, um, and Forrest was my second fight. But I think uh, that night I actually came as close to reaching my full potential as I ever have. You hit the flow state. That's awesome. Um, guys, exactly. we have no more questions in the queue. Anybody else have a quick question for Jeremy before we turn it over to Professor Buyu and Professor Tom? Uh, we do have a last minute question here. Uh, Jeremy, did you practice any striking martial arts? If so, what? Um, so when I first started training, it was at a local club in Omaha um, with, under a guy named Robert Bussey. And I don't know uh, how many of you guys are, are like old school martial arts uh, aficionados, but he was really well known in the, um, I want to say late 80s, early 90s in the whole ninja craze. And he did all that. So I started training in him, in his organization. And it was a fairly eclectic organization. You know, we did um, a little bit of wrestling, a little bit of judo, a little bit of traditional weapons, um, a little bit of striking, more of the, you know, the taekwondo karate uh, you know, kind of a generic Taekwondo karate style. Um, and then we did a little bit of grappling. And I think that's what, what kept us slightly ahead of the curve, uh, just because where most people were just doing traditional martial arts, um, we were doing a little bit of grappling. So we were a little bit better than, than the average people. Uh, but we, were, we weren't doing enough grappling to compete with, obviously, the, the, the modern day people today. But we were doing enough striking that I could, you know, I could punch a wrestler and I could tackle a karate guy. I, you know, I couldn't beat either one of them at what they were good at, but I could do something different. So that's part of what gave me a little bit of an edge uh, when I started fighting. But, uh, but yeah, so we did a little bit of traditional striking, but nothing major. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm getting uh, flooded in the feed here with a lot of thank yous for you and a lot of uh, compliments about your shirt. I, I didn't see it. <laughs> if you want to hold oh, it. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Uh, you always have the nice shirts, Horn. Uh, also, we have a question from uh, Professor James. He wants to know how Hooney is doing and when you're going to give him back to us. <laughs> well, I, I don't know that nickname. Who are we talking about? Uh, Daniel. Little oh, Danny. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, he's doing great. He, he moved up north a bit now, so he only comes in on Saturdays. He's about an hour away now, but, uh, but he's doing great. I know he, uh, he bounces back out there every now and then to visit you guys, right? He does. He does. Yeah, he's a world traveler. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. All right. I think that's all we have for you, Horn. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Professor Buyu, Professor Tom, to take us out with a QA. and a um, I wanted to thank everybody that's on here. You guys are awesome. I love seeing your faces. 
Um, isolation is not a thing for me, but uh, this is the second best. Can't wait to be on the mats with you guys. Professor Tom, go ahead. No, nice guys. Nice time. Jeremy, that was awesome. I, I super appreciate your time. Thanks for, and, and your friend as well, for being able to show us that stuff. And, you know, really the biggest thing for me is, of course, the, the moves are awesome and things like that, but being able to see everybody's face and, you know, some people first time and things like that, missing everybody, you know, I, I haven't seen a lot of you guys in a long time. So this is, this is my favorite part of the week. Buyo, you good? You're yes, frozen. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Professor uh, Jeremy. Uh, that was awesome. Great technique. Thank you for your time, for your friend to be there with you, you know. Uh, and I want to extend the invitation, like, for the next couple of Tuesdays and Thursdays. If you want to pop in, if you want to uh, have your presence, it will be great, you know. Um, like I said in the beginning, uh, this is bigger than all of us. It's just like to give every single one of us like a little piece of uh, understanding that uh, some people are in the same boat, some people don't, some people have a better boat, some people have a boat not that good, but uh, the whole understanding that uh, we are in this together, we're gonna go through this, and with the people like you, it just make the night even better. Maybe for Tom, the afternoon, you know, and for other people all over the world, uh, evenings or mornings, you know? So uh, thank you very much, Professor. Thanks, guys. It was good to see you guys again. Jeremy, just as an aside, you are always welcome in Colorado and Miami. And, you know, we would love to have you maybe host a seminar when all this is done, bring you out, and, and you can show all this stuff in detail and let everybody drill it and practice. That would be awesome. I, I would love to. I'm much better hands-on. I'm not good <laughs> in front of a camera. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a long time coming, Jeremy. We need to get you out here, man, because yeah, we got we to gotta talk business and stuff, too. Awesome. All right, guys, I got to run. Uh, it's good, great to see everybody again. Uh, hopefully we can do this again. Well, hopefully this doesn't last too long, but we can do it again if it does. Thanks, Horn. See you guys. Yep. All right, guys, some of you have geese on, and some of you are really lucky to have training partners. So uh, if you guys are ready to start rolling, go for it. If anybody else has questions, uh, Professor Tom, Professor Buyu, and I will be here for a little bit longer. And it's great seeing your faces. It's great to see Rennie and Diesel on today. So happy to have you guys, Technica and Arise, Professor Pottle, Miss Katie, I'm gonna start your book soon. Ben, I hope you're not sleeping. <laughs> we, had, uh, we had 14 black belts on this chat today. So that was pretty awesome. You know, that, that should be a good message for everybody. You never stop learning. You know, I mean, all the time I, I tell my guys and gals, you know, even if it's one little tiny piece, something I've used for a long time and it's some little nuanced thing that, that somebody can share and, and we all learn from, that's, a, that's pretty awesome. You know, implement that. If you guys have your geese on and you got partners, train, enjoy it. You guys are lucky. lucky. Yeah. All right, guys, have a great evening. I'll see you guys Thursday. Uh, Professor James is going to be teaching Thursday, so hopefully he doesn't have his headset up against the wall Thursday, looking like he's sleeping. Um, and then next week we have um, – well, do we want to tell it, Buyu? Who we got next week, Tuesday, Thursday? Not yet? I can't see your face, but are you get, telling me quiet? No, not yet. On, Tuesday, okay. on Thursday we can announce. All right, Thursday we'll let you guys know who's next, next week, but it's pretty exciting. All right, have a great night, guys. Thank you, guys. Have a Thank great you. night. Good seeing you guys. Good night, everybody. Good night, Diesel. Good night. Bye, guys. Bye. Good night, guys. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. I can't exit it. Thank you. Rob is rolling. You guys are lucky. You guys are lucky. <laughs> Have a good night, guys. Good night.